Hi folks, this is Dr. Rob Sivis, and I recently had an epiphany. I spoke at, um, a was invited to speak in India at a very, very large international conference that was put on um, by the Indian Metabolic Society. And I then subsequently did a video with the two leaders of this, which is gonna drop uh, in the next segment. And it is an absolute must-see video uh, in terms of what these two folks have done to revolutionize um, and combat uh, diseases in India. And just uh, to put it into perspective, um, take a guess how many people in India, just by, by magnitude, think this one through, how many people in India have already confirmed diagnosis of type 2 diabetes? An A1C above 6.5. Forget about those that are pre-diabetic. Forget about those that don't even that are out there and there's many of them that have diabetes that just haven't been diagnosed. What do you think the number of people are in India itself who have type 2 diabetes? Think that one through. And the answer is over, over 200 million people, almost the entire population of the United States in India has type 2 diabetes. It is an epidemic and is in large part brought about by their reliance on industrialized processed sugar and starch, a shift toward a higher carbohydrate diet, and in about 80 plus percent of folks in India, um, they are Hindu, and many of them are uh, religiously vegetarian, and what I call white vegetarians, where they're eating primarily rices, uh, breads, and starches as the priority for their diet, plus a genetic predisposition to lower insulin production, genetic predisposition to, toward diabetes, obesity being the other side. So some will gain some weight and then cross over to diabetes. Um, but this Metabolic Society of India has done an amazing job and completely changed my mindset of what you can do at an individual basis. So for example, in my practice, I'm known as the carb addiction doc. We look at the consumption, in, certainly in the US, as an addiction to carbohydrates. And I think while that remains true, uh, it is somewhat difficult to manage at that astronomical level the intensity of management of carbohydrate abstinence. And in fact, here's what's changed in my mindset is how do you take dedicated religious vegetarians and improve their health? And there are three strategies, three very, very simple strategies that still to a large extent confine to Hinduism that these two gentlemen have used in themselves when both of them were, were in their own journey had a diagnosis of type 2 diabetes, reversed that, but also very simply without major effort can transition a whole population away from diabetes. So yes, you may not be perfectly healthy, but you can certainly correct your diabetes. The first change that they make is what they call 202060 or CPF. Um, I'll explain what this means in a second, but folks, the average diabetic person, in order to, be, to develop type 2 diabetes, on average, over a long period of time, you are eating about 80 to 90% of your calories as carbohydrates. And that is not defined by what goes in your mouth. A lot of people say, oh, this is healthy, this is unhealthy, based on what goes in your mouth. This is defined by glucose, galactose, and fructose entering your bloodstream, where 80 to 90% of the caloric load entering your bloodstream is some form of simple sugar or starch, irrespective of how it went to your mouth. Because remember, what goes in your mouth gets metabolized by the human body. And what 202060 means is uh, it is a method to reduce the 80 to 90% carbohydrates that we're eating down to 20%. And over time, if you can slowly eliminate the obvious sources of significant carbohydrates, absorbable carbohydrates, and get down to a 20% average carbohydrate load, you will get your diabetes into remission. It will happen. And then the focus is a behavioral and a dietary transformation to sustain um, that 20% over the rest of your life to keep your diabetes into remission. In other words, we don't cure diabetes. We put it into remission. It can always come back if you go back to eating that way. But the 20-20-60 is 20% carbohydrates. And at first, to make it very simple at a population level, 
we use net carbohydrates um, and then slowly you can transition across to total carbohydrates because on a vegetarian diet, a lot of your food is cellulose, it's plant-based cellulose, although that only accounts to between 5 and 10% of your total carbohydrate load, total carbohydrate load. So if you start with net carbohydrates around 100 grams, um, and that's 20% of your diet, um, then the second 20% is 20% of protein, and we'll discuss on a vegetarian diet where you can get your protein in. They go into detail about this, uh, and I'll discuss that in a little bit in this video. And then the third part is to slowly ramp up your fat percentage so that at least 60% of your food is fat, which is also a challenge on a vegetarian diet. But um, D-Life has done an amazing job of helping people very simply, very easily to find those 60% of fat. And they've also given you substitutes of how you can reduce the carbohydrates without significantly changing the cultural aspects of eating um, by, by reducing or eliminating the types of foods that contain carbohydrates, but still giving you um, the same quality of foods like roti. You can make roti out of uh, things that don't contain high carbohydrates. And D-Life does a wonderful, wonderful job of showing you how to do that. In fact, if you go to uh, dlife.india, they have over 2,000 Indian low-carb and keto recipes that you can use that are vegetarian or vegetarian-based. And it is an amazing website where you just get blown away by the different selections. And you don't have to be Indian to eat this way. We've started incorporating some of these meals as uh, uh, latitudinal items in our own diet. And we love the food. We love the food. So you'll understand a little bit later in this video where we go. But if you go to dlife.india or dlife.in, you will see on their website 2,000 plus low-carb and keto recipes that help to put diabetes into remission. But the first point they make is 20% of your calories should be carbohydrates, 20% should be protein, and 60% should be fats. And whether that's animal fats, which can be butter, uh, uh, paneer, or cheese, or it can be primarily plant-based fats, but that would be then eliminating the seed oils, but using olive oil, coconut oil, and avocado oil as a way to enrich the fat content of what you're eating. And starting out with net 100 grams of carbohydrates, trying to get to that point, and then slowly as you become more experienced in this, transitioning ultimately to the holy grail, that is 100, no more than 100 grams of total carbohydrates per day as a 20% fraction of what you're eating calorically. And just that transformation, plus the two other elements that we're going to talk about, will put your type 2 diabetes into remission, assuming that you have pure type 2 diabetes. Now, remember, we're talking about populations, not just individuals. But that eating pattern, that transformation of eating pattern is doable. It's economically doable. It's pragmatically doable, together with the other two principles. And um, just that will get rid of or put diabetes into remission or make your diabetes much, much more manageable so that you don't have the endpoint diseases, cardiovascular disease, uh, kidney disease, amputations, which are the major issues, blindness, the major issues related to out-of-control diabetes. So this diet is intended to support metabolic health by focusing more on foods that are nutrient-dense while being mindful about how the macronutrients are distributed. Hi folks, this is Dr. Rob Sivas. I am the Carb Addiction Doc. And so often, I have patients who have these idiosyncratic spikes in blood pressure. They may or may not be on blood pressure medication. But if you're monitoring your blood pressure and you are concerned about a sudden spike, why the hell did that happen? One of the um, tools and weapons that we can have at home, uh, and I would strongly advocate for people doing this as an experiment, is to use a ketone IQ. Ketone IQ has been demonstrated scientifically to vasodilate blood vessels. So it creates a vasodilation, it increases nitric oxide, oxide release from uh, the endothelial cells, and it may transiently help you to drop your blood pressure. So yes, take your medication, but if you find why the hell is my blood pressure up and I do or do not want to take a medication, try the ketone IQ, have a swig of one of these bottles and monitor your blood pressure, but do not do ketone IQ and ignore your medication.
but it does have a significant ancillary response to vasodilation and acutely dropping blood pressure a little bit to be able to manage hypertension better. The science for this is in a podcast on my YouTube channel that I just did with the research head of Ketone IQ, Lat Mansur. The second thing that they promote very heavily is the Jason Fung, and Jason started this with a group of Indian and Southeast Asian folks who had diabetes to the point of kidney disease, chronic renal failure based on their diabetes. So um, simply using an 18-6 or a 16-8 model of two, maybe three meals a day, preferably two meals a day with a protracted period of not eating. So the 16 to 18 hours where these folks do not eat, you're having two, maybe three meals a day, not snacking in between. So just that simple concept of intermittent fasting introduced and then slowly practiced together with a 60-20-20. And then the third issue is making sure that we are able to get adequate protein and fat in their diet because one of the problems with a pure vegetarian diet it is heavily reliant on carbohydrates but also relatively poorly reliant on protein and fat so there are certain protein rich vegetables uh, that are promoted in this diet but even within hinduism the majority of hindus are comfortable eating two products that completely transform their metabolic health and these are renewable animal products. The first one are eggs. And I was interested to find out that duck eggs are a largely produced form of egg. It's not just chicken eggs. It's duck eggs and chicken eggs that are abundantly available in India at relatively low cost. So just by introducing eggs um, into their diet as a condiment to their food, I'm going to show you a video uh, not a video, a photograph uh, from one of the these uh, Indian folks' talks. Um, and uh, it's a guy by the name of Shashi that shared this kindly with me. And um, this slide will show you in graphic photographic pictures what you can do with eggs in your diet, just incorporating them in the food that you eat. The second thing, and I think this is something that we certainly should steal from uh, the Indians into our Western diet. And that is a reliance on what they call paneer. What is paneer? Paneer is cottage cheese. And we have to completely rethink cottage cheese as a way of cooking in a vegetarian diet. Now, as long as you're not vegan and you are comfortable using cheese, um, cottage cheese is relatively bland um, it is not powerful in taste, so it is an excellent binder. It is an excellent food to use as a condiment, as a way of cooking, as a methodology to cook food. And again, I'm going to show you from Shashi's, uh, uh, Shashi's um, shared uh, PDF, I'm going to show you some pictures of how the Indians use paneer or cottage cheese in their diet. And again, it's one of those bland things like flour that works very well, but it isn't flour. It is a dairy product, which is absolutely phenomenal. So they're using eggs, they're using paneer, and then including also the making of reta, which is a yogurt that can be used as a condiment on anything that you eat. So it can be used in salads instead of salad dressing. It can be used on your food. It often has some cucumber in it. It is an ideal, reta is an ideal high fat, excellent micronutrient source of food that still to a large extent, conforms with a vegetarian diet. And then the final thing that I think we can definitely do in this country. Folks, when, when I first see a patient, I always ask them, what medications or what supplements are you on? I don't even ask them, what are you not, uh, are you on any? I just straightforward ask, what are you on? Because almost everybody's taking something. And here in, in uh, um, the US and in the Western half of the world, um, the majority of people are taking supplements which are very often promoted, that in India are called marsala. Now, what is marsala in India? Marsala is the word they use for spices. So, for example, if you take something like turmeric, turmeric in India is a spice. They use it as part of their cooking. And there are multiple, multiple foods that we use in pill form from the regular ones like garlic and ginger, uh, cardamom. But there are 
many, many things that are sold at GNC in pill form and you're paying ridiculous amounts of money and you take them as a capsule or a pill that are just spices. Why not literally spice up your spice rack and add these marsalas, add these spices to your food? I can tell you that a big bottle of turmeric is a hell of a lot less expensive than all the pills that you buy from GNC. So why not buy your supplements in part from an Indian marsala store, which are available all over the country, you can order them online, rather than take them in pill form. And again, this revolutionized how we cook, how we prepare our foods. Um, you can add these excellent spices, not in pill form, but as a way to revolutionize the taste and the type of food that you're eating at home. So we can learn from the Indians to add eggs, to add paneer or cottage cheese instead of the flours, and to add um, uh, these spices as supplements to our food. And in that way, you are getting everything in you need to be healthy at a macro and micronutrient level, still conforming to a vegetarian type diet a lacto-ovo-vegetarian diet, but getting rid of metabolic health. I, I, it just revolutioned, and it's so simplistic, it's so obvious, but it has to be said. That's why I'm doing this preamble video. And to Anup and Shashi, thank you so much for not only doing this in India, but bringing this to us over here, bring this to the rest of the world as a transformation in a way of thinking about nutrition, not, you don't have to be hardcore carnivore. You can still stick to some of your principles. And I know you're going to have the folks out there that are coming, oh, I should are beating that drum. But you know what? We're not talking to you. You're already better than this. But this is good enough. And it's about health and it's about a healthy way of living that conforms to your choice. So it's revolutionized my way of thinking. Am I still going to support the hardcore line? Yes, I'm not changing that. I'm just broadening as a physician the scope of healthy eating and bringing more people under the umbrella because we've always thought of carnivore and radical keto and high fat, low carb eating as a radical movement. This revolutionizes what we're talking about that is more palatable, more acceptable to the entirety of our population. In fact, the only people that are not willing to do what we've just talked about are people that are using their diet as a pretext as a pretext not to be healthier. There is absolutely no reason that you cannot conform from a 60-20-20 all the way through to pure carnivore. That should be the latitude of all diets. Beyond that, on the vegan vegetarian side, where we don't incorporate these foods, is anti-human. It is a non-physiologic diet and you cannot supplement your way out of veganism. You will suffer. You may choose to suffer, but you will suffer. On the spectrum, anywhere from what I just talked about all the way through to pure carnivore, you can pitch yourself where you want to. That is healthy human eating. And as my friend Ken Berry says, it is the PhD. It is the proper human diet in all of its diversity. I am the Carb Addiction Doc.